kind of a walk around area, but I hunt all, virtually all over the state. I get out of Wyoming, Colorado, and uh, a little bit of South Dakota also. And uh, one of the, it's my passion is predator hunting. I got into it over 30 years ago. Just a quick story is uh, how I got into it was shot a snowshoe rabbit, I was about 12 years old, and the thing went for a headshot, spine thing, thing squealing like crazy, and my dad's uncle took it actually. Before I could take him, finish the thing off, he had me sit down, just position me up in a tree, or along a down treetop, pop over the top, and uh, just whispered to me to sit and wait, and yeah, it seemed like eternity, but it was about maybe 10 minutes, 15 minutes, I got a glimpse of something moving, all of a sudden it looked like I had yellow eyeballs 35 yards away that were that big around just staring at me. And uh, that's how I got my first Kyle. It just gave me an adrenaline rush that I still get today. Uh, what I want to take and do is really just go through the information from most of my guide trips. I get a lot of people that are doing most things right and are coming in with a couple of questions on why they're not having success. So what I've done is really kind of geared this around the fundamentals and the basics and really just for compiling a lot of the questions that come up. If you're going to run it, go okay. ahead. If you want it. First, just kind of starting off with the basics, uh, really the things that I want to take and cover. Uh, coyotes, everybody knows, they're near the top of the food chain. But I really want to take a strong look with you at these two points. The location, judging your habitat, and the setup. And most of the things that I see with most clients, this is the area that that subtle little things need to be done in. Then I'm going to cover a little bit on calls and I'll walk through just some of the equipment that I use. Coyotes, uh, I give them a lot of respect. It's, you know, most people, coyotes are varmints, they want them dead. They're one of the most adaptive animals that I've ever hunted. Uh, people that think that hunting whitetail is hard, nah, that you got to up your game for them. Their sense of, uh, or their senses, uh, smell, sight, well beyond what whitetail are. Uh, their adaptive behaviors, they can live anywhere from the metro parks in Milwaukee to, you know, the rocks of Arizona, sage grass. Uh, their food sources, they can adapt to whatever's there. They can eat out of garbage cans, much like a possum or a coon. Uh, they really cover a lot. One of the reasons why you see populations vary so much is that you really have limited predators to them. Cougar, wolves, and after that you really don't have a lot. You know, a fisher might take if they get them by the neck, but that's pretty rare. And just the amount of bass home range. They can range anywhere from a square mile to 12, 14 square miles. So it really creates a lot of unique, different type of habitats that we're going to hunt in. And then just the thing that I always go back to, they're not easily fooled with that level of senses that they have. What I found in finding success is really just keying in on the details. Pay attention to the little things that you're doing is going to make the difference in success for you. When I start looking at locations, and this is just some sample pictures of some of the different areas that I hunt, some of the heavily wooded areas, agricultural fields, uh, deer hunting, food plots, timbered land, areas that's down, and what I really find is in each area really poses some unique things that you need to look at, and it's not looking at the general area, but really get into the specifics of looking at it. You know, and the first thing I always ask and want to say is, do you know that there's coyotes there? You know, is this where you see them? Guys that bull hunt, they see an occasional coyote crossing a ridge top or running down through a valley. Uh, you know, are they seeing, are you finding tracks? Are you finding scat in here? And when you look at, you know, you know that they're visiting this area, it's really identifying how are they using this area. Uh, one of the things that's unique to this, my daughter shot this picture of me while I was out doing some scouting, but when I got just over this lip, I knew that coyotes, I hear them at night sparking up, barking, just right after sunset. Well, I found there's dens in these treetops that are laying down here. There was dens down in here. So I know I got a bedding area. I got travel routes coming up the adjoining valley or ridge top the other side. 
where this little swale is across here. I see very few rabbits in this particular field. I see very few hawks out here. But I always see tracks where this little swale is, so I know that they're coming out and this is just a travel road. Uh, you heard me earlier when I was talking with Adam. This is a spot out in South Dakota. It's a spot I just stopped at when I'm driving. It's a half hour sun I do. I take a coyote out of this valley uh, twice a year for eight straight years. It's just really understanding, and I know they bed down in all those little coolies. When I'm scouting back in hardwoods, you'll see the tracks. Most commonly, most guys are going to see the tracks when you're following a deer trail. But what I start looking for is there are a lot of scat. What's in the scat? Not that I'm actually picking it up, but you know, you'll see that there's hair in there. Uh, gives me an idea by the concentration of it, what's their food source in there? Are they eating a lot of rabbits? Are they getting the chipmunks out of the logs? Are they feeding a lot of mice? I look for those type of details in there. Then I'm associating the habitat to what I'm finding. If the farmer's got a lot of set aside, I know there's gonna be a lot of mice in there. And it also relates to how I'm gonna call it, how I'm gonna set that up. But that's how I start evaluating my properties. I look at what is the feature to that area that enables me to set up that's kind of gear everything else. So that's what I start out with. What kind of area am I looking at? Okay. The next thing when I'm looking at is to know the area to which you're calling. As I was mentioning, it's knowing what that offers. But some of the other things that I always go back to is look at the adverse effects that you have. And in the next couple of slides, I'm going to take and show you some really good examples of things that affect your sets that you may not be currently looking at. One of the things that I do now, and ever since the Google Maps has come about, is satellite imagery. Before I ever go out to a property, when I have a client that wants me to come up and hunt on their property, first thing I'm asking for is give me the address. You know, give me something on there and I can pull it up. And I print out all the satellite images and I start taking this level of a view of what I'm looking at. So, for instance, as I'm looking at the contours, the brush that's out here, the clumps of trees, the opening, open gaps in here. This tells me there's openings in the woods. I start piecing together all the pieces of the puzzle and evaluate where potential sets are and what I should expect to see when I get out there. Next is really understanding the wind and how that's going to affect and understanding how I'm going to get into. When I look at a travel route, I'm talking about myself. How am I going to enter the property? When I know that this is a bedding area right up in here and right back up on this other side. You know, one of the things that I don't want to do in an early afternoon is take a travel route where I'm walking through. Also looking at wind base. If I got a strong east wind blowing across here, one of the things that I don't want to do is take and walk this line down because they're going to win me right away. I want to look at alternate routes on how I can enter into here and really just kind of looking and there's one I got busted on while I was walking out. Took him quarter wind shot, just thought I would take and sneak out along the field and I got busted sitting right in the fence row. One that read the manual and I should have known better and just uh, put in. I make mistakes once in a while. When I mentioned about adverse effects, and this is the next thing when I'm looking at locations that I start picking at. This property was picked initially by driving by, there's a road to the north that's just off of the screen. Looking at this, I would get sightings, I'd see coyotes crossing this field in here, coming down along this secondary creek bed. This creek bed is so deep of water and anybody could just step over it. What I didn't know at the time, and I was so hyped for this property, I started going out at night, 10.30, 11 o'clock, pull up with my truck at an intersection right up here, get on a howler, just blast a couple howls. I'd have coyotes sparking off back in here, and I thought this was God's gift to me and the best place to hunt. First time I got in here to make a set, got up along this wood line, and it's actually pretty open on this creek bed was sitting at. All of a sudden I have dogs barking at me. I could hear them, they'd come up and just get that beep, beep, beep. When I came to look at, once I looked at it on a satellite, the river here. River wasn't frozen, 
they're coming up, and what I was getting was coyotes coming up on the bank. They wouldn't cry, obviously, they wouldn't swim across the river. So it's kind of looking at that adverse effect of what barrier, what natural barriers are out there. Uh, one of the other things that I take and really look for is fence lines coming through a property and where the intersections are, what kind of fences they have out. And one of the things that's, again, is off of here, if you take this, continue to the north, following this fence line comes up right to a farm, right to the back of a barn. What I've been finding is that they'll run these rolls of fence lines, but when you get into human interaction, it works as a natural barrier that's gonna stop and break their patterning. So as I'm looking at these, now that I'm kind of picked up, this is more of a late winter spot, in my opinion. I target this in January, early February, when the rivers froze. It gives me the greatest amount of area to cover. This is about, we're looking at about maybe two and a half to three square miles, which is about what a typical coyote tax range is. So now what I'm going to do after looking at this and knowing that I've overcome my adverse effects and barriers when this river froze, I can take in call from anywhere and I have nothing virtually to stop them. So now what I do is I look at wind direction and that is the next thing that I have to apply to every property and will prevent me from hunting on a property. Starting with an east wind, if I got a straight east wind blowing away, you can nearly always count on a coyote taking you, circling, and coming nose into the wind. Of course, there's a few that don't read the manual and, you know, the exception to every rule. But typically what you're going to look for is when you're drawing them across into a wind, and I'm just taking the example of an east, what I'm looking at first then is where my potential area to set up is. There is farm activity that goes on up in here, so that I'll take a rule out because even in the wintertime, I'll have more out, spread manure, etc. So what I'm usually looking for is to get into these little gaps with an east, straight east wind. I'm going to try to come somewhere directly into my set location. On this, I'll target to try to get two sets in, being that it's about two to two and a half square miles. I look at a calling range of about a square mile, one and a half square miles is what my calling range is. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at this for the first set. I'm going to target about the first general area of this. And I want to take and try to pull to one of these openings in here. So what I'm going to look for is my, my entry based on the wind that I can get a direct set to where I want to be. So on an east or a southeast wind, my scent's going to go this way. They're going to want to come hook around and come into the wind. So that's where I'm going to target something in the, like these little brush lines, something that's going to give me some background cover that I can sit in. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to target coming to the opposite end of the property. So I see in here, this is more of a marshy grassland out here, sporadic trees. This is a denser piece of wood. This is an elevated plateau that's about 80 to 90 feet above the bottom. So by looking at this in a topo aspect of it, I know that my greatest bedding opportunities are going to be up in here. They're going to be along this clump range right in here. So what I'm going to look at the second is, I'm going to want to take and get upwind of those areas that I figure are going to be the prime locations to draw them off of. And put myself somewhere in this position for a second call. What I don't want to do is get up where I'm downwind of them for my calling. I would be drawing them the largest distance. So actually I'd be looking at drawing a coyote to circle around this way, which would put me at a disadvantage. So in a property of this nature, I'm looking at one to two sets, and based on an east wind scenario coming across, I would target something in these small patches. Always keeping in mind, when you get out and do your scouting ahead of time and you're looking at these, it's always looking at your vantage point. Where's gonna give you the greatest level of visibility that you can see the most? Because what you're really trying to do is get that look at them as they're still quartered wind. They may be 400, 600 yards out or 200 yards out. When they do that quartering around you to hook that upwind and come those up, if you can get that glimpse of them, you've got the advantage because you're not going to have the element of surprise when they just step out and 
30 yards and there they are. Now, just kind of on the other scenario, if I have a stiff west wind coming across this property, then I'm drawing them back into the wind. Now I'm gonna start looking at getting out into these further clumps or off the corner of the fence line where I can take and go off of these clumps. And this is a property, when I do have a stiff west wind, what I've been finding, we got a tree stand that's set back up in here that the homeowner uh, had for deer hunting. It's about 16 feet up to the floor. Gives an incredible view out of this. And we do a single set on a stiff west wind on here. We're able just to walk this fence line straight up to it. And we're usually drawing most of what we see comes right up through this brush line, right through in here. This is just another view of a property that's south of there, and it kind of the same thing. When I'm looking at this, a lot of the areas that I seem to get into have the marshy, you know, kind of marsh area, tall grass back out here, the rivers. So what I'm looking at is I've got for early season or summer hunting, I can pull out of these clumps, I can set up in these bottlenecks, watch the bottleneck areas, and it gives me a vast calling area but I do change how I approach this once I'm in winter, once this is frozen over. When I'm pulling to the north, I've got an easier access off of the road up here, but I can set up on these and pull a greater area in the wintertime when this is froze, as opposed to when it's, you know, summertime, then I'm really narrowed down my calling area. And this is a property where, again, I've had Coyotes come out on the riverbanks, sit there and bark at me. I have no opportunity at them because I can't retrieve them. Just another one. This one really took me by an element of surprise. Did a drive-by on this farm coming up along from the east side of this. This is an area I see coyotes running this back fence line. I see them coming across when I go out at night pull the truck up, I'll do some hauling, do some locating, just to find out where the packs are running at. Stop, talk to this farmer, he was, oh yeah, get on here, shoot every dang one of them, so usually very easy to gain access for. When I pulled this up on a satellite, I was just really shocked to find, here I had a whole section of residential houses back here that I didn't know. So just from a safety factor, I know that it takes my shooting element out, that I really only have a north to south shooting range on here that I can safely discharge. So now what I'm looking at is, I know that this is only a travel route. There's nothing on here that they're feeding by. This is an area that I'll look at for later winter, early spring, doing some calling, and I'm pulling them in for the longer distance. Okay, just an example of where a north-south wind is, how I'll approach this property. When I have an east to west wind, it really doesn't do me a lot of justice in a property like that. Kind of just uh, looking at just one more view and taking a back out when I look at a larger range, we're looking at about an area of about five square miles. You mentioned you were in Boscobelle area. So this is real similar, I mean, really near Topo to what you're looking at. Uh, one of the applications that I downloaded lately is uh, the Cabela's Recon, it's a free app. And what's real nice with it, if you use any of the smartphones, is it'll give you all your totals. So when I'm looking at satellite images of a property or a proposed area that I'm going to head out to, that's one of the things I can do. I can pull my smartphone out to 